Unitarian Universalism is changing. It is changing because the needs of the world are changing. One way in which our faith is changing is the balance we have historically struck between the needs of the individual and the needs of the community. When I speak with other UU leaders across the association, I find that the tension between the individual and the community is often symbolically reduced, rightly or wrongly, to a discussion of the tension found between our first and seventh principles. Our first principle speaks of the inherent worth and dignity of every person, while the seventh principle speaks of the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Now I'm going to tell you, there is a reason why the first is first and the seventh is seventh. Historically, both Unitarians and Universalists placed a high premium on the idea of individuality. This makes perfect sense. Our forebears into faith going back hundreds of years were all raving heretics. The Unitarians said Jesus wasn't God, and the Universalists said, hey, everybody's going to heaven in the end, so chill out. Now, these kinds of ideas don't make you friends among Catholics and Protestants, and historically speaking, it has only been a very recent development that has seen Catholics and Protestants lose the immense power that they once wielded over the Western Hemisphere for centuries and millennia. It took great courage and great perseverance for our theological fathers and mothers to stand up against the powers that be. It meant inviting persecution, inviting suffering, sometimes inviting even death. It meant standing alone. And it takes a strong sense of self, some really radical individualism, to be willing to fight the power and suffer for your beliefs on that scale. So in that regard, individuality, individualism, yay, they are wonderful. But as you all probably know, every strength does have a weakness. Radical individualism has its shadow side as well. I'm sure you can see it. Think of it this way. Try putting a bunch of radical individualists together into a group and see what happens. Or oftentimes, what doesn't happen. I used to be an English teacher. What was the motto of the Three Musketeers? Anyone? All for one and one for all. I would suggest that if the Three Musketeers had been Unitarians, their motto probably would have been me for me. And then the book would have never gotten written. Individualism served a great purpose for our faith when it was illegal or at least impolite to be different. Freedom of thought and freedom of belief was the big draw to Unitarian Universalism, and it still is a big part of who we are as a faith community. But as the great Robert Dillon tells us, the times they are changing. What church survey after church survey tells us now is that people, and especially younger people, the millennials, People who have never lived in a culture dominated by any church don't particularly care about beliefs or creeds, what those creeds are, whether or not they even exist. For most people today, the most important thing about church, any church, is not the list of beliefs or non-beliefs, but rather the fact that they are a community. That is the most important thing that people are looking for in 2014. If we wish to grow as a faith and as a congregation, we must pay attention to which way the wind is blowing. We must, in many ways, shift the primacy of our focus from the individual to the community. But not just any community. Beloved community. American philosopher Josiah Royce coined the phrase beloved community in his 1913 book, The Problem of Christianity. The phrase has been picked up by several philosophers and ministers since, who are philosophers themselves, including the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who, after the Montgomery bus boycott, declared, the end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. So what is the beloved community? What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it smell like? I believe each of us here today possesses some small part of the answer. And it is an answer and a question that we are going to struggle with and devote much of our time to as a congregation in the future. For now, though, 
if I may offer a perhaps overly broad, overly simplified answer, I might say this. Beloved community happens as a process. When we all together lift up our highest ideals and live them. As a church, it is vitally important that we get this beloved community thing right. Why? Because I believe what UU minister John Burens once wrote, that ultimately the work of the church is the transformation of society. And I believe, like Taoist philosopher Lao Tzu, that macro changes begin in micro places. It was Lao Tzu who reminded us that if there is to be peace in the world, there must be peace in the nations. And if there is to be peace in the nations, then there must be peace in the cities. If there is to be peace in the cities, there must be peace between neighbors. If there is to be peace between neighbors, there must be peace in the home. If there is to be peace in the home, then there must be peace in the heart. We here must become a beloved community so that the entire world might become a beloved community too. As the bumper sticker attributed to Gandhi suggests, we must be the change we wish to see in the world. FYI, he never actually said that, but it's a good quote anyway. Let's not kid ourselves. The world is often a dark, chaotic, and frightening place. If you have been paying any attention to the news this summer, you know exactly this. This year, we have seen bloodshed across the world from Gaza to Iraq to the Ukraine. Children kidnapped in Nigeria. Planes literally falling out of the sky. A humanitarian crisis involving migrant children on our own southern border. Just this past week, we lost a man who brought smiles and laughter to millions of people but could not defeat his own inner demons, a very real reminder to all of us of the power of unchecked anxiety and depression. Oh, and, and of course we are once again facing the killing of yet another unarmed black teenager in these United States. And I haven't even mentioned the headlines we no longer see, the, the headlines that aren't being written anymore because there isn't enough political will to address them. So they fall off the map of our collective attention. Issues like global warming, the plight of the poor, overpopulation of prisons, the list, of course, could go on. Look, the world is in trouble. This is a point that I think most you use might actually agree with fundamentalist Christians on. The world needs saving. The difference, of course, is that fundamentalists want to save the world from some future damnation waiting for us when we slip from the hands of an angry God. Unitarian Universalism, on the other hand, wants to save us from the hell we create for ourselves here in this world, a hell born from selfishness, hatred, fear, apathy. Poets and prophets across the span of history have often looked at the unique trials and tribulations faced by their generation and wondered, is this the end? Despair has a way of reminding us all about our own mortality and the terminality of the species. This morning, I'd like to share with you a poem written by one such poet prophet who looked into the darkness facing his own generation and took the time to write down what he saw. Many of you will be familiar with this poem. It's entitled The Second Coming by William Butler Yeats. Turning and turning in the widening gyre the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the, the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spirit as Mundi troubles my sight. A waste of desert sand, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs while all about it wind shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep 
were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast his hour come round at last slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. The end, according to Yeats, begins with a widening orbit. Let me say that again. According to Yeats, the end begins with a widening orbit. He uses the image of a falconer orbiting her falconer. The falcon loses the falconer's voice. Her orbits grow wider, thus making it ever less likely she will ever hear the falconer's familiar voice and return to center, return to source. As the orbit widens, the narrator comes to a terrifying realization. The center cannot hold. The falcon is lost. Anarchy is loosened upon the world. It is a powerful image. It is a powerful concept. Now, if I may be so bold, I would like to add to Yeats' work a related image of my own. I liken Yeats' falcon and falconer to a solar system. At the center is a sun, a massive source of light and heat spiraling around this sun are planets, each following its own orbit connected to the center by invisible strings of gravity. Together, the planets dance with a sort of cosmic choreography around that central star. It is a picture of order and predictability in the midst of a dark sea of chaos. But the key to everything is that sun in the center. If that sun were to lose its mass, if it were to lose its gravitational pull, then the orbits of each surrounding planet would widen until finally they broke away and hurtled into the dark chaos of space. This is the terrifying reality if the center cannot hold. This is the beginning of the end. Yeats believed he was glimpsing this in the early 20th century in the aftermath of World War I. From Yeats' view, the falcon had lost the voice of her falconer. The sun was losing its grip on the planets. Humanity was hurtling headlong into the dark chaos of moral anarchy, a strait between unrelenting apathy and unfocused passion. There are times, perhaps much like today, when I take a step back and I look at the world and I wonder if we are once again approaching the end. Like Yeats, I look around and I see things falling apart all around me. And I ask myself, can the center hold? I don't have an easy answer for you. If you came out this Sunday looking for a church that doled out easy answers, you came to the wrong place. This is not the church of the easy answer. I don't have a genie in a bottle who will grant us all our wishes for peace and justice in this land. I don't have a God in a box who will magically appear when called upon to grant us all our prayers, whether earnest or empty. So what do I have? Well, in my best moments, which are tragically too far and few between, I admit, but in my best moments, like you, I have a pair of eyes that refuse to close no matter how much suffering they see around them. In my best moments, I have legs that in the words of Sister Simone Campbell, enable me to walk toward the sound of trouble. In my best moments, I have hands eager to do whatever must be done to incarnate justice in this world. In my best moments, I have a mind, an open mind that I refuse to close that will listen to new ideas about old problems. And most importantly, in my best moments, I have a heart full of love that compels me to keep moving forward even when I fall to the despair and the darkness and the hopelessness. I have a heart that compels me at least to fall forward and then to pick myself up again and force myself to push onward to create the kind of world that every child of God deserves. Can the center hold? I don't know. But I think. I believe that it will.
Now, my faith is not a blind one. It's actually grounded in knowledge. See, I, I know a few things, right? For example, I know that this image of a solar system, of planets circling a central sun, is a symbol of community. Each individual with his or her own orbit, but all in a perfect dance with each other, all circling round about a central source. Ah, and I know what the center is what it can be for each of us, the center that holds us all together, the center that orders our movements, that gives us the light and warmth of hope. That center is love. And I know a secret about love, too, one that well-meaning scientists, you know, shouldn't tell you about, but I'll tell you about it. See, what I'm going to tell you is that love has mass. That's good news. Love has mass. Say it. Love has mass. So you see, the more love we pour into the center, the more massive the center becomes, the stronger the gravitational pull becomes. So can the center hold? I don't know for sure. I don't have the easy answer, but you know, the, the more I think about it, the more I let myself ponder on that question, the more I look at this beloved community. Well, if, if I were a betting man, then you know what I think? I would put my money down on the table, and I think I would say, yes, the center can hold. Yes, the center will hold. How do I know? Because I believe in the power of beloved community. I believe in its power to grow. I believe the center will hold because we will hold the center. That is what our faith compels us to do. I look forward with great anticipation to the days that lie before us, the beloved community of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Jacksonville. I look forward to plumbing the depths of love with each of you, teaching and learning from each other, upholding each other, keeping each other accountable to our mutual promises to love one another. We must learn how to love more and better and farther than we ever have before. We must grow love. We must grow it first in our hearts, then in our homes. We must grow love among our neighbors. We must grow it in our city, Jacksonville, Florida. We must grow love in this nation because only then will it grow across the entire world. And that is our vision. Blessed be.